Welcome to Algebra Readiness for students in kindergarten through grade two. It is one thing to see threads of algebraic thinking in a student response, or to notice gaps in thinking. It is quite another thing to know how to teach the student to develop his or her thinking in productive ways. The goals of this video are to help you increase your students' understanding of algebraic concepts and develop their algebraic thinking in productive ways by analyzing tasks, implementing high cognitive demand tasks, and assessing student thinking. These goals will be accomplished by looking at the cognitive demand of tasks, the algebraic habits of mind, the maintenance of cognitive demand, lesson planning, and questioning techniques. Here are four tasks. Take a moment to read them and think about how they are the same and how they are different. They all have something to do with place value, yet each is engaging the student at a different level. The thinking required to complete each task is different. As the previous four examples showed, not all tasks are created equal, and different tasks will provoke different levels and kinds of thinking. Why is this important? The level and kind of thinking in which students engage determines what they will learn. So let's begin by talking about how to choose a good task. What criteria should we look for? Analyzing tasks. Cognitive demand. One aspect of analyzing a task is examining its cognitive demand. But first, let's clarify what we mean by a mathematical task. Mathematical tasks are a set of problems, or a single problem, the purpose of which is to focus students' attention on a particular mathematical idea. You will see several examples of tasks as we move through this presentation. There is no decision that teachers make that has a greater impact on students' opportunities to learn, and on their perceptions about what mathematics is, than the selection or creation of the tasks with which the teacher engages students in studying mathematics. Think about the power of this statement. The tasks you choose not only impact the student's opportunities to learn, but impact their perceptions about what mathematics is. Therefore, selecting high-quality tasks is one of the most important decisions you as a teacher will make. So how do you determine whether tasks are of high quality or not? There are multiple ways to examine a task. You could look for the number and kinds of representations evoked. For example, to solve a task, students may create a table of values and a graph to represent a mathematical situation. Another way to examine tasks is to think about the variety of ways the problem could be approached. Or you could think about the requirements for communication. Do students have to write about their thinking process? Do students have to share with others how they solve the problem? Another way to examine a task, and the one we're focusing on here, is to analyze the cognitive demands of the task. What do we mean by cognitive demand of a task? We mean the kind and level of thinking required of students in order to successfully engage with and solve the task. When characterizing the cognitive demands of tasks, we can classify them as low-level tasks or high-level tasks. A low-level task is one that merely requires recall of memorized facts or completion of a procedure that has no connection to the underlying concept. A high-level task, on the other hand, might ask students to make connections between a procedure and its conceptual basis. These connections not only help the student make sense of the procedure, but increase the likelihood that it will be recalled and used appropriately. Another type of high-level task involves what is called doing mathematics. 
When students do mathematics, they are actively involved in exploring, investigating, modeling, conjecturing, and verifying. Doing mathematics requires complex and non-algorithmic thinking. Let's take a look at tasks that illustrate these four types of cognitive demand. This task is one commonly used in textbooks or assessments. If students have memorized the place value of each digit, this task merely requires the recall of those facts. There is no connection to the concept of place value. This task requires the use of an algorithm or procedure, but there is no connection to the concept of subtraction, and the emphasis is on finding the correct answer rather than the process. No explanation is required, and there is no expectation of understanding. In this task, the same subtraction problem is being completed, but with the use of base 10 blocks. Through the use of manipulatives, the teacher can help the students make connections between the subtraction algorithm and the base 10 representation. The process of subtracting is no longer a memorized series of steps but a procedure that makes sense and has connections to a physical model. Students are asked to explain how they solve the problem with the base 10 blocks while making connections to the algorithm. This task requires student engagement, not mindless manipulation. The students are developing a deeper level of understanding of subtraction by making meaning of what they do. This last example asks students to perform the same subtraction problem, 51 minus 28, but does not tell the students how to approach the problem. The task requires more cognitive effort than the previous ones because the student must analyze the task and use relevant knowledge to solve it. Let's assume for a moment that a student has placed 28 stickers on the grid in two rows of 10 and one row of 8. She may add two more stickers to complete the row of 8. Then add two more rows of 10. And finally one more sticker to make a total of 51. Counting how many stickers were added, she would find that 2 plus 10 plus 10 plus 1 equals 23. 23 stickers would be needed to make 51. Using an open-ended task like this allows the student to work from where she or he is in terms of prior knowledge, and allows for multiple approaches. If students then share with others their approaches, they are exposed to multiple ways of solving the same task. This helps students to form connections and relationships that are not otherwise possible, thus leading to a deeper understanding of the concepts embedded in the task. Often, a task may appear to be of high cognitive demand because of superficial features such as the use of manipulatives, a real-world context, or because it requires multiple steps. These aspects alone do not raise the cognitive level of a task. Remember, it has more to do with what the student is being asked to do. Another consideration when choosing a task is to consider the prior knowledge and experiences of your students. These can impact the cognitive demand of a task as well. Also, the norms of the classroom are important. If students feel comfortable taking risks and making mistakes, then the cognitive demand of the task can be maintained. But we'll discuss that in depth later. Analyzing Tasks Algebraic Habits of Mind Cognitive demand is only one way to analyze tasks. Another way to analyze tasks is for the algebraic habits of mind that they elicit. Don't let the title algebraic habits of mind fool you. Although algebra is a course that is typically taught in grades 8 and above, the habits of mind that are needed to become successful algebra students are formed at an early age. Let's consider our typical approach to teaching. In this cartoon, the first boy says, I taught Stripe how to whistle. The second boy responds, I don't hear him whistling. The first boy says, 
I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. As a teacher, you may often feel this way. In the field of algebra, we often teach things to students that include a procedural approach to algebra. But students fail to understand the true nature of algebraic thinking. Algebra is not about a set of mundane procedures, but about the structure and patterns of numbers and the relationships among them. Like Stripe learning to whistle, all students need the opportunity to engage meaningfully in learning algebra, rather than merely watching someone else do algebra. That is, students need to develop ways of thinking and doing algebra, called algebraic habits of mind. So what are algebraic habits of mind? Essentially, they are the habits of applying productive lines of algebraic thinking whenever working on a mathematical task. They are the common ways of thinking that students need to develop to learn algebra meaningfully and to be able to apply algebra to mathematical situations. In developing this framework, Mark Driscoll and his colleagues at the Educational Development Center have identified three specific habits of mind that lead to understanding and using algebra in meaningful ways. These habits of mind include doing and undoing, building rules to represent functions, and abstracting from computation. Let's take a deeper look at what each of these mean. A central tenet of the doing and undoing habit of mind is reversibility. In algebra, reversibility plays a central role because students need to be able to undo mathematical processes as well as do them. In other words, students must understand the process well enough to work back from the answer to a starting point. At the high school level, students are often asked to solve equations like the quadratic equation x squared minus 5x plus 6 equals 0. Using factoring and knowledge about products that result in 0, an algebra student can solve this equation to find the solutions 2 and 3. However, students that exhibit algebraic reasoning not only can solve this equation, but they can also work backwards. That is, if they are given the solutions x equals 2 and x equals 3, they can find the quadratic equation that has these two solutions by undoing the procedures they would use to find the solutions. So what does this mean for grades K through 2? The processes of doing and undoing and the act of considering reversibility can begin in the primary grades. As teachers consider the types of mathematical tasks to give to students, it's important to evaluate whether the task could be phrased differently to provide a foundation for doing and undoing. For example, as an alternative to asking students to complete a list of several addition problems, like 2 plus 5, teachers can choose to ask students to consider what pairs of numbers have a sum of 7. In doing so, students have the opportunity to build number sense and will be prepared to reason using reversibility as they develop into algebraic thinkers teachers can find many meaningful contexts to engage students in tasks like these. For example, this task builds reasoning skills using the problem called peas and carrots. Students are engaged with the task. I have seven things on my plate. Some are peas. Some are carrots. How many of each could I have? How many peas? How many carrots? By asking students to share different responses and organize their solutions, students can see relationships between different pairs of numbers that sum to 7. Carrie Rose is a second grade teacher at Baker Elementary School in Winchester, Indiana. As you watch the following clip of Ms. Rose's class, consider how she poses tasks that would be considered doing and undoing. In each small group, I'm giving you a card and it has a certain amount of money on it. You have to use only 10 coins. No more, no less. And it has to equal this amount. If your group needs to use a wipe off board, um, I'm going to give each group those coins. You will have a bag of dimes, a bag of nickels, a bag of pennies. Okay, I will bring around the coins and you need to brainstorm and work together and come up with how you can make your amount with 10 
Children are often posed doing tasks involving money where they have to determine the value of the given set of coins. However, Ms. Rose used an undoing task involving money where the amount was given and the students had to determine what set of coins would produce that amount. Placing additional restrictions, such as the limitation of 10 coins, increases the difficulty of this task. The second algebraic habit of mind is building rules to represent functions. Functions play a central role in the algebra curriculum, and the ideas that motivate the development of the concept of function begin in the primary grades. These ideas include seeing and predicting patterns, describing and justifying rules that describe numeric relationships in a context, and describing change using different representations. Students in high school are expected to analyze situations and determine whether the situation describes a linear, quadratic, exponential, or other type of function. Let's demonstrate with an example. Andy is saving money for a new DVD player. He began saving with a $5 gift and will continue to save $2 each week. How much money will he have saved at the end of N weeks? One possible solution strategy may be to organize the information into a table. Andy begins with $5. After one week, he will have $7. After two weeks, $9, and so on. Algebraic thinkers can look for patterns in such problems, like the fact that there is a common difference of two. By noticing the change in numbers as constant, one can realize that the situation describes a linear function. Since the initial amount was $5 and the change is $2, after n weeks, Andy will have saved 5 plus 2n dollars. The building rules to represent functions habit of mind begins in the primary grades when students are asked to predict patterns, analyze change, and describe and justify their rules. Here's a task that could be used with early elementary students. Three people can sit at a table shaped like a triangle. If you join two triangular tables end to end, how many people could you seat at the new table? What if you join three triangular tables end to end? Can you predict how many people could sit at 10 tables, 50 tables, 100 tables? Elizabeth Winarski is a kindergarten and first grade teacher at the Project School in Bloomington, Indiana. She embeds patterns throughout her room, including the classroom calendar. On this day, Ms. Winarski's students are investigating the patterns from the calendar. Here's what I did. I thought about how we've been thinking about our calendar patterns for a while. And how this was the first calendar pattern that we started thinking about. Right, where we had the butterfly, oh, a praying mantis, and then the beetle. Yeah, and then I thought about the one that we just finished up. Right? It's Frog and Toad, and Henry and Mudge, and um, Elephant and Piggy. And so, you know, I noticed that we had done these calendars, but I was hoping that you could help me today. If you and a partner took these pictures, and you could tell me what you notice. And so just like when we had our animal photographs, and you and a partner went, and you wrote down all the things that you noticed in that picture, I want you to do the same with this picture. Okay? And if you need to write on this somewhere, please do that. Ms. Winarski gives the students time to discuss the patterns they notice in the calendars in pairs. They record their findings while they discuss. In doing so, the students engage in a mathematical process known as chunking, where students look for repeated chunks of information. These chunks can help students discover how a pattern works. It is inherent in algebraic thinking. After debriefing their findings as a group, Ms. Winarski presents a related task about patterns. So mathematicians, we just took some time to notice how in our calendar um, pieces, things repeat. 
And we notice how it went. Butterfly, praying mantis, beetle. Butterfly, praying mantis, beetle. And if there was a pattern because it happened over and over again. And so you and your partner are going to get a basket of cubes. And I want to see what pattern you come up with where something happens over and over again. So I'm going to make one. And I'm going to use these two cubes. Natalia, do you see them? Red and blue. I'm going to add a red. Tell the person next to you what you think of that one next. Tell the person quickly. What do you think I'm going to add next? Okay. Now tell the person next. Having students describe rules for patterns and predict future values of the pattern is an important step in helping students to develop readiness for algebraic thinking in future grades. A third algebraic habit of mind is abstracting from computation. This includes students' abilities to generalize beyond examples, calculate without computing, recognize and represent equivalent expressions, and justify computational shortcuts. Driscoll has described this as the capacity to think about computations independently of the particular numbers used. Many of the properties used in symbolic algebra, such as the commutative property, the associative property, and the distributive property, can and should be developed as students learn about numbers. In middle and high school, our hope is that students can rely on number sense developed in elementary school to reason algebraically. For example, students should be able to identify which number is larger, 5% of 7 million or 7% of 5 million, without actually computing both percentages. Students that are algebraic thinkers can mentally use their knowledge of numbers to decompose 5% into 1 one hundredth times 5, and decompose 7 million into 7 times 1 million. Using the commutative property, one can justify that these two expressions are equivalent. However, learning to think in such ways is partially based on the experiences one develops in the primary grades. In the K2 classroom, students should have opportunities to use number sense to develop abstract relationships about numbers. For example, after students consider the sums of several pairs of odd numbers, an important question to ask students might be, what did you notice about the sum of two odd numbers? Furthermore, asking students to draw pictures to support their reasoning develops their abstract thinking. Ms. Wendy Scott is a second grade teacher at Baker Elementary School in Winchester, Indiana. Let's talk about this as a class family. I'm interested in what you are thinking. Okay? So, remember we said step one was to read through the directions till we understand what they're asking for. Okay? Lee and Al each have 50 cents. Lee has all dimes. Al has all nickels. Each loses one coin. Who has more money left? Why? Okay, so there's a couple of different questions there. One question is asking for who has the money, who has more money left? And then the next question is asking why? Questions like the one that Ms. Scott posed about Al and Lee prompt the students to consider important concepts. Ideally, students should be able to understand that when one takes away a larger amount, the resulting amount will be less. This is the kind of thinking, calculating without computing, that is essential for making abstract justifications about number relationships. Taken together, these three habits of mind form the basis for evaluating tasks for algebraic reasoning in all grades. Doing and undoing includes finding the input from the output and working backwards to solve a problem. The features of building rules to represent functions include organizing information, predicting patterns, chunking information, describing a rule, using different representations, describing change in patterns, and justifying rules. Finally, 
Abstracting from computation includes developing computational shortcuts, calculating without computing, generalizing beyond examples, finding equivalent expressions, using symbolic expressions, and justifying shortcuts and computational methods. Incorporating these features in the elementary curriculum will ensure that students are prepared to engage in algebraic reasoning in the middle and high school. Implementing Tasks – Maintaining Cognitive Demand All teachers have been there. You think you've planned a great lesson, but then the students react in ways that, well, you just didn't expect. Consider this cartoon. I don't get this math problem. Let's use these Skittles to help you visualize. If I put 10 Skittles in front of you, then I ask for 6 of them back, how many Skittles would there be? None. Okay, let's try it with Brussels sprouts. As teachers implement tasks, it's important to keep in mind the learners and how they will understand and interact with the materials used. Although using cognitively demanding tasks provide opportunities for students to think mathematically, research has shown that cognitively demanding tasks may not be implemented in cognitively demanding ways. A large-scale research project during the 1990s, entitled Quantitative Understanding, Amplifying Student Achievement and Reasoning, or Quasar for short, documented the effects of incorporating inquiry-based instruction in economically disadvantaged schools. Based at the University of Pittsburgh, the project investigated a number of middle school math classrooms across the nation. The study partially focused on the kinds of tasks that teachers posed and the ways that they implemented them in the classroom. Based on the results, the Quasar researchers developed a framework to consider how tasks may evolve throughout the instructional process. First, tasks appear in written curricula or instructional materials. Second, Tasks are set up by the teachers. This sometimes differs from the written curriculum because teachers choose to modify tasks or present them in a different way than the written materials. Third, tasks are implemented by students. Student interpretation may modify a task or acts of the teacher while students work may modify how students interact with the task. Finally, the task in its written, intended, and enacted forms impact what mathematics the students have an opportunity to learn. Results of the Quasar research showed that when the teacher introduced high cognitively demanding tasks, and it was enacted by students in high cognitively demanding ways, student learning was high. Similarly, if the teacher introduced primarily low-level tasks, students engaged in low levels of thinking. This resulted in low levels of student learning. The most interesting finding is that if teachers provided students with high-level tasks and students did not engage in the tasks at high levels, the student's learning was moderate. This has an important implication for classroom teachers because it suggests that giving students opportunities to engage in cognitively demanding tasks produces better student learning results, regardless of how the students enact the tasks. Such findings confirm the goals of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, which posits that effective mathematics teaching requires understanding what students know and need to learn, and then challenging and supporting them to learn it well. Given that the highest level of student learning occurs when students engage in the task in cognitively demanding ways, it is important to consider how to implement tasks in ways that maintain the high cognitive demand of a task. The Quasar researchers documented at least seven factors that were associated with the maintenance of high demand tasks. For example, one method is teacher scaffolding of student thinking. By scaffolding, we mean that teachers pose thought-provoking questions to students in ways that preserve the complexity of the mathematical task. 
Let's see how Ms. Winarski scaffolded her students' thinking as the students explored the calendar task. Ms. Winarski's questions were focused on trying to understand what constitutes a pattern. Rather than just naming each of the parts, she focused the children's attention on how they knew it was a pattern. Although Elizabeth, the first student, is pointing to items left to right, Lauren, the second student, points at pictures somewhat randomly, suggesting she may not see the pattern. Through Ms. Winarski's questions, she scaffolds Lauren's thinking and prompts Elizabeth to re-explain the pattern she discovered to help Lauren see the pattern. By helping students to discover patterns on their own, rather than providing them with the answer, Ms. Winarski is maintaining the cognitive demand of the task. The students must think and reason to solve the task, not the teacher. In addition, the teacher must assist students to draw connections between important concepts for example, in the prior clip, Ms. Winarski used multiple techniques, such as the calendar and building with blocks, to help students to look for the meaning of patterns. She wanted students to understand that the concept of pattern is understanding repetition of a particular group of items. Students also need opportunities to monitor their own progress. Students should be aware of what successful completion of a task will look like, and determine whether they have met instructional goals. A fourth factor requires teachers or capable students to model high-level performance. All students must be held accountable for high-level products. Teachers should pay careful attention not to accept incorrect or incomplete mathematical answers. Where appropriate, teachers or other students can model what would constitute acceptable, high-quality responses. Mathematics is a subject in which justification and explanation are inherent. Teachers must press students to justify, explain, or provide meaning to the work that they do. Teachers can do this through their questions, comments, or feedback that they provide to students. The cognitive demand of a mathematical task has been shown to decline when students focus solely on getting correct answers rather than explaining or justifying their work. 
teachers should be wary to emphasize sense-making rather than correctness. Let's observe students in Ms. Scott's class as they explore the Al and Lee problem. This task was set up to require students to explain their reasoning, and throughout the lesson, Ms. Scott asked the students to explain their reasoning to one another. The focus was not on getting the correct answer of Al, but knowing why that answer was correct. Communication of mathematical ideas is an essential part of effective mathematics learning. So the value of the coin really made a big difference, it? Yeah. That coin being more money took Al's, uh, well, it took Lee's number down more than it took their okay. So how did it Instruction must be based on where students are currently at. Tasks should build on students' prior knowledge of mathematics and experiences in the world. For example, in the following clip, Ms. Rose asked her students to develop number sentences that have the answer of two. Students are sharing their solutions. Take note of how Ms. Rose builds on the students' thinking. Three on your board. Dylan, give us a number sentence for two. Five. Times five minus twenty-three equals two. Hmm. Now let's figure this out. You guys help me out with this one, Dylan. What? Help us out because some of us said, "What's times? How do we times?" And some of you know, know a, lot, a lot about multiplication, Dylan. To help us out. What is five times five? We said that multiplication was groups of. So you guys know how to count by fives. So help us, Dylan. That is right. 5 times 5 equals what? 25. 25. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. And if I take away 23, do I have two left? Yes. Good number. I have that one too. In this clip, we saw Ms. Rose build on the students' prior knowledge in several ways. First, she documented the students' solution strategies rather than her own. Second, she referred to multiplication as groups of a certain number. Finally, she used students' knowledge of counting by fives to help the students understand why 5 times 5 is 25. Building on students' prior knowledge is important to maintain the cognitive demand of a task, because it helps students to understand and make sense of abstract situations. Finally, teachers need to ensure that students have sufficient time to engage in the task. Too little time will prevent students from wrestling with deep mathematical ideas. However, too much time can lead to off-task behavior. Based on research about cognitive demand, your challenge as a K-2 teacher is clear. Make sure that students have a steady diet of high-demand tasks and that the demand level is maintained as teachers and students interact with those tasks in the classroom. Implementing Tasks Planning a Lesson When designing a lesson that is inquiry-based, rather than teacher-directed, one structure to follow is the three-part lesson plan. Launch, Explore, and Summarize. Jacinda Gates is a kindergarten teacher at Baker Elementary School in Winchester, Indiana. Let's observe Ms. Gates as she prepares her class to work on a task involving pennies in a cup. 
Today we're going to play a little game with a friend, and we're going to see if we can figure out how many pennies are inside the cup without Oh man, how in the world, Dane, do you think we can do that if we don't look? We don't uh, look in the cup. How can we figure it out? Say, you could think. You could think? What would you think about if you were thinking about what was still inside the cup? Five. 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 There's two. Could out. there be seven? No. Why not? Because there's already five. What's the highest number it could ever be? Ten. Ten. One hundred. One hundred? What if, what's the highest, what's the number that we have all together? Five. Five. So today, what's the highest number it could be? Ten. If we only have five, five. could it be ten? No. Five. It could only be five. five. Could it be four? Yes. Yeah. Could it be nine? Yes. Yeah. No. Could it be zero? Yes. 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 No. no. How yes. can we find out? Look. No. But we're not going to look. You could shake it to see. We could, oh, because if there were none, what would it sound like? No, nothing. nothing. Okay, so we have to have some rules, don't we? Yeah. What, guess what one of the rules is? No shaking the cup. Oh. oh. Do you think it would sound different if there were no pennies in the cup? Yeah. You could shake it there were no pennies in the cup. Would, would it sound different if there was just one penny in the cup? Yeah. 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 No. We'll just have to think about how many could still be mm. in the cup. How many do you think could still be in my cup? Two. How can we find two. out? Two. Two. No, look. Two. Oh, yes, we're two. not going to look. We're going to count the ones that are two. out so we can think the ones that are in. Can you show us how to do that, really? One, two, three, four, seven, eight, two more left. One in the cup. Everybody give me a thumbs up if you agree. Give me a thumbs down if you think it's something other than one. Let's find out. One. Are you ready to try it with a friend? Yeah. Okay. If, I pick you. I pick you. If you are the friend with the cup, what's your job? Two. Well, how will you do it? If you are the friend that has the cup, dump it. All of it? No. Okay, so you're you get to pick how many are out, and what should you do with your cup? Put it behind you. Hide it from your friend. We take turns. Ms. Right? Gates made sure her students understood the task before they went to work in pairs. She also established clear expectations for the students regarding use of the cup. For example, she let them know that they could not shake the cup to determine how many were left, as students would immediately know by the lack of sound that the cup was empty. The launch portion of a lesson can be used not only to make sure that the task is understood and to establish clear expectations, but also to activate prior knowledge needed to complete the task. As students work in pairs, Ms. Gates moves about the room scaffolding student thinking as needed.
Ms. Gates allowed the students to work on their own while she listened. Through questioning, she was able to determine what the students did and did not understand. Was it tricky? Yes. I can't trick it. During the explore portion of a lesson, it's important for the teacher to let the students work on the task, while carefully listening, posing questions, and providing hints as necessary. Sometimes during this part of the lesson, a group of students finishes early or becomes bored with the task. At that time, the teacher may want to consider providing an appropriate extension to the problem. In Ms. Gates' classroom, if a pair of students needed a challenge, she could have given them additional pennies and asked them to continue questioning one another. In this particular case, she waited and used an extension with the entire class. After the students worked in groups with five pennies, Ms. Gates brought them back together to share the results and prepare them for the next task of working with ten pennies. Once again, the students worked in pairs to determine the number of pennies left in the cup after a certain amount was removed. After a sufficient amount of time, she brought them back together to share once again. Let's look in on Ms. Gates' classroom as she begins to debrief the lesson. How many of you thought that was harder than just five? Me! Why do you think it was harder, Caitlin? Because, because um, ten is more than five. Ten is more than five, and it gets harder the higher the numbers are. We're really good up to five, aren't we, Charlie? Hey, you got it. All right. Do you see what I'm holding? Yes, a number strip. A number strip, a number line. Ruthie was using a number line to help her figure out how many were still in the cup. Ruthie, if I take some pennies out, can you show them what you did? We know that there are 10 pennies in the cup. And I'm taking some pennies out of How Four. many pennies did I take out? Four. Four. So, Ruthie, what number should we put one yes. finger on? Four. And we have to get all the way to what number? Ten. Ten. So we're going to help her count as she moves her finger. Are you ready? <coughs> She's on four. four. Ready? We're going to count. Move your finger. One. Two, three, four, five, six. How many pennies should be in the cup? Six. Six, because four is six away from ten. Let's find out. During the summarized portion of the lesson, Ms. Gates prompted students to share their solution strategies, such as using a number line, or using fingers to model the problem given. They discussed how both methods were valid approaches to solving the problem.
is right, Addie or Ruthie? Both. Both. How can they both be right? They did totally different things. Because they both got it right. How did they both get it right? Because they, uh, they both got the same number. They both got the same number? And they both got it right. As long as we know that there's 10 in the end, it doesn't matter if we count up or down. down. It's like adding and subtracting. The summarized portion of the lesson is the time to promote whole class discussion. Listen actively to student solutions and emphasize the key points or main ideas in the lesson. This portion of the lesson is very important and should not be ignored or cut short. It is during this time that students learn from each other and form connections between different approaches used. The teacher plays an important role in orchestrating the class discussion and prompting students to share strategies. Assessing Student Thinking Questioning Techniques Formative assessment is any assessment task designed to promote students' learning. These tasks give both teachers and students feedback so that teaching and learning activities can be altered according to the results. Formative assessment is different from summative assessment, the goal of which is to measure mastery. Formative assessment is thus assessment for learning. It is a type of assessment that drives instruction. As you think about formative assessment, it is good to consider where your students currently are in their understanding, where they are heading, and how you will get them there. Questioning students is one means of formative assessment that can provide you, the teacher, with that information. Let's take a look at different types of questions and the purpose of each. Assessing questions are those that clarify what the student has done and what the student understands about what they have done. For example, you might ask, how do you know? Or can you show me where this came from? Advancing questions, on the other hand, move students beyond their current thinking by pressing students to extend what they know to a new situation. This type of question will often begin with, what if? In an earlier example, Kira had 28 stickers and wanted to know how many more she would need to have 51. You might ask a student, what if Kira only had 18 stickers? Then how many would she need? Or what if Kira had 38 stickers? How many more would she need? Then follow up with, do you see a pattern in your answers? This type of questioning would move the student beyond the current situation to consider how decreasing or increasing the number of stickers Kira has by 10 affects the outcome. The third type of question is one that manages or focuses the student. Examples of this type of question would be, what do you know and what do you need to know? Or, is there a way you could organize your work to help you notice patterns? Today we will see examples of teachers using the first two types of questions. In this clip, we revisit Ms. Winarski's class. Here we see her using assessing questions to help her clarify what her students understand about patterns. What you noticed on that calendar? Um, I noticed that they were um, a pattern like butterfly and cricket and beetle all over again. Did anyone else notice?
I'm going to show you the picture. I've got yours right here. I want you to look at this. If we had more cards to place there. What do you think, David? A praying mantis. What do you think? Whisper to the person next to you if you think a praying mantis would come next. Ms. Winarski first asked a student what she noticed about the pattern and then asked students to give a thumbs up if they noticed the same thing. This provided information about her students' understanding of the pattern. Then Ms. Winarski went on to ask her students which animal, the butterfly, the praying mantis, or the beetle, would come next on the calendar. With this question, she is assessing their understanding of the repeating nature of the pattern. In this clip, we revisit Ms. Rose's class as they discuss different ways to make two. She uses advancing questions to move her students beyond the current topic to consider patterns of evens and odds. As you watch this video clip, take notice of the questions Ms. Rose poses. It would be more than 9,000. He wanted to know, he asked me when he was doing this, he said, I want to do one million, and I know what it is, but I'm not sure how to say it. How many zeros does one million have, Wade? Six. Six. Okay, so how am I going to write it, Wade? Help me out. One, six, zero. One with six zeros. I'm going to need my commas here. And then he knew... Ms. Rose helped her students notice that the difference of two consecutive even or odd numbers is always two. Through Ms. Rose's advancing questions, she helped her students notice a pattern and extended their knowledge beyond the topic of finding number sentences that make this two. So, look what's happening. Look, this is an eight. Here's some zeros, 100 minus 98. Eights and zeros are both what kind of numbers? Evens. Evens. So, evens equal evens. So does that mean if I'm starting with an odd, that I would need to take away an odd to get two? Well, look at this one. This is 25 minus 23. Is 25 and 23 both odd yeah. and an equal 2? And this one was both even and equal 2. And this one is a multiplication. But he's saying this is an even number. And I took away the next even number, the one that comes before, and it equals 2. You guys think it would be that way always? No. Yeah. It would have to be an even minus an even to make 2, and then an odd minus an odd to make 2? No. Here is a task we used earlier as an example of building rules. If your students were working on this task, what are some questions you could ask to assess or advance your students' thinking? Take a moment to jot down some ideas. Here are some possible questions you might ask. How are you counting? What happens when you add a new triangle? What's the relationship between the number of tables and the number of people? Can you write a rule that tells you how many people can sit at any number of tables? When working on mathematical tasks that require complex thinking, students will often throw up their hands in frustration and say, I just don't get it or I just don't know where to start. Instead of telling them what to do, try some of these questions. What don't you get? What's confusing? Where did you get stuck? What makes this problem hard? What would make this problem easier? Asking these types of questions can diffuse the situation and help the student to focus on what they do know. We have covered a lot of information in this session. We looked at analyzing tasks through the lens of cognitive demand, the kind and level of thinking required of students in order to successfully engage with and solve a task, and algebraic habits of mind, doing and undoing, building rules to represent functions, and abstracting from computation. We then looked at implementing high cognitive demand tasks, how we maintain the level of cognitive demand and how we successfully plan a lesson around that task. Finally, we looked at assessing student thinking through the use of questions, 
assessing questions, and advancing questions. We would like to invite you to consider how to incorporate the ideas shared in this presentation into your classroom. Use the following guidelines for you to consider how to get started. First, choose an existing task from your curriculum materials. Analyze the task for cognitive demand and algebraic habits of mind. If the task does not provide students opportunities to build connections or engage in problem solving through doing mathematics, consider how you can modify the task to increase its cognitive demand. Next, anticipate the types of difficulties or misunderstandings that students may encounter when engaging in the task. Finally, plan appropriate scaffolds and questions to react to students. Thank you for taking the time to listen and learn. As you put this knowledge into practice, remember that it will take time to feel comfortable with this new approach, but the benefits for your students will be worth the effort.